Welcome back to the Giants, guys. Extremely special guest this week. Giants Ring of Honor, two-time Super Bowl champion, absolute legend for Big Blue, number 58, Carl Banks. Run out, run out. Woo! Guess what, people? You're listening to another episode of the Giants, guys. And you always know you're in the right place when Jeff does that weird thing with his arms. I don't so know what it is, You always know Carl. you're in the right spot. I can't help it. Well, <laughs> My day yeah, is made right there. Carl just did it with, to do with the, the movie uh, Wedding Crashers. And, it's it's Will Ferrell. And, and Jeff always starts to show off with that. So um, I'm going to read you <laughs> off a list, Jeff. Tell me if this sounds like um, someone that used to wear blue. Um, third overall pick in 1984, two-time Super Bowl champ, all-decade team, ring of honor, top 10 all-time in sacks, voice of the Giants since 2007, owner of G3 Sports, does that sound like somebody you know, Jeff? It sounds very familiar. Carl, is that anybody you know? Is that a resume you're familiar with? I have a few people with those. Uh, <laughs> Similar resume. Well, those accolades. I'm not sure I can put it on one person. But... <laughs> well, thank Carl. Thank you. For... said 2012 Michigan State Hall of Fame inductee. I was. I, I know was it would have been. Come on, Craig. <laughs> See, I was holding on to my Michigan State questions. He, but thanks, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, we have uh, Jeff in the building and Michael. We gave Spiro and, and, and Mikey Fresh the day off so we could spend some time with Carl. Um, you've been good to us over the years. You and I have chatted a million times. Um, I'm going to start off with, with a little bit. Um, since my daughter's going to Michigan State in two years to play field hockey in the Big Ten, nice. I'm going to ask you a couple Michigan State questions if you don't mind. Okay. All right, cool. So... 1984 draft. You're the third overall pick. I even had to write the names down. I know Irving Fryer, but Irving Fryer and Dean Stanko go before you. So as a kid from Michigan, like, do you, are you excited to go to New York, or you know, are you overwhelmed about going to New York? And of course, the second question would be: Is are you familiar with Lawrence Taylor is doing since he's been there for three years? Yeah, so um, the, to answer the first question, like being the third player picked overall and actually the first player drafted on draft day, if you think about it, because those other guys were, were pre-drafted, um, I was over the moon because I was just thrilled to be drafted. I had no idea that um, I was ranked that high or... Uh, was projected to go that high you know keep in mind this is pre-internet and so it's all about you know the uh, the magazines the quarterly magazines so I you know I wasn't ranked that high and then after the combines I'm, I'm sure there were some people on tv talking but I had no idea um, that I was going to be drafted that high and then yeah everybody knew who Lawrence Taylor was but you know the thing is I was a Midwest guy so I knew Dick Buckus, I knew Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, and all of those guys. But yeah, this Lawrence Taylor was just like the Mr. Everything. But, um, you know, and plus I knew Brad Van Pelt, who was like our childhood hero. We, he, he, his, his high school, may he rest in peace, but his, his high school and my high school would play each other every year and he was Mr. Everything in every sport, right? So I knew him and plus he was a Michigan State great. Um, so I knew he was there at Michigan, I mean, at, um, at the Giants as well, but I didn't know a lot about uh, Brian Kelly and, you know, I knew about Harry Carson, but it was just like, I did ju just didn't know the tradition of that Giants defense, you know, as a whole. I, I saw the, uh, the interview you gave where you said Harry Carson and Taylor were hanging out and they looked at you and they said, what are you going to do to get on the field? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was kind of the most eye opening moment as a pro I ever got. And that was like my first, first moment in the building, like, and I'm wide eyed and really excited to meet these two great players. And Harry's, you know, uh, his greeting to me was that. So it became a little sobering, like, okay, this is a business, you know, and I'm sure, he wasn't happy because two of his guys were gone as a result of me being there and Gary reasons. Yeah. I was going to ask you like, how is that? Like, 
like you said, both Michigan guys, both both Spartans, both Giants, and you kind of wind up then replacing Van Pelt. Like, is that like a lot of pressure out of the gate, or is that something like you're already overwhelmed? There's nothing to, you can't even concept that. Um, I wasn't even, you know, I, I I did not feel the pressure, and thankfully, I was just so naive that <laughs> I just wanted to go in and be the best that I could be, right? So I I didn't. I wasn't up on the whole politics of, you know, team dynamics and and things of that nature. I I was, you know, a captain at Michigan State and I never participated in all the bullshit, excuse me. So I was kind of above it. Um, So, you know, those guys left, I knew it. I knew that, you know, they weren't happy about it, but listen, it wasn't, you know, I I didn't get rid of those guys and I didn't draft myself. So my job was just to go in and do the best I could. And, you know, um, and then our first practice, like Lawrence practiced faster than I ever played (laughs) um, a football game ever in life, right? So I knew that there was another level you had to go to. And, um, you know, I went there and just had to just show that I was worthy of of being the pick. But, you know, there were a lot of questions, you know, um, from fans as to why. And, um, you know, as, as, as I look back on my career, I hope I answered that question. Uh, I'd say so. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, you know, I, th- I thought a lot about him, like, the whole Van Pelt thing. And then, like, you guys went to the same school. He, like you said, he was in, like, he played, like, five sports and, like, lettered in every sport. Yeah, so he, was like, he was like Jim Thorpe growing <laughs> yeah. up. Like, he was everything. And, in, in like, middle school to high school to college, he was literally everything. He had, like, the shot put record, he had everywhere. And I was a shot putter in high school. Um, but like, he was like Mr. Everything, legit, like really, really good. Did you guys uh, keep friends, uh, stay friends over the years at all? Or I no? just, I, you know, I just um, admired and said hello to him. Like I, we really never crossed paths where we just hung out together. Okay. But mm-hmm. like every time I saw him at a Michigan State game, if he came back, or through our communities, because he was in a, a community that was like maybe 20 minutes away. But our, like I said, our high schools played each other. You know, I would always say hello to him because he was the guy that everybody looked up to. Sure. Well, let me ask you about numbers. Because like, you know, numbers are like vital for some people. It's marketing, it's identity. You're, you're 54, right? You, you go to the Giants, like, does Andy Hedden at all entertain giving you 54 or do the giants just slap a 58 on you? Cause I mean, these guys nowadays, like they're buying each other's numbers. They're so, doing. Yeah. So uh, it's so interesting. I just had this, this conversation uh, with someone over at the giants this morning. Um, so when I, the process was, you know, you go through your orientation, your physicals, you know, and your next stop It's you know, trainers, this, that, and then equipment. And so you just go to the equipment window and Andy Hedden's there waiting on me. You know, he's like, oh boy, I know you wore 54 in college. I'll sell it to you for like 30 grand. What? And so I just looked at the equipment manager and I said, give me, give me a Jersey. So whatever he pulled out, that was going to be my number. So he pulled out 58. I'm like, okay, this is my number. I just, I didn't even entertain it. Wow. Like I'm, you know, I guess I'm a little different or indifferent because I never really gave that much thought to the number itself, right? Yeah, sure. It was just what you do in the number and then it's somebody else's. It's like everybody is, um, I, I was looking on, on, um, social media and people were telling the kid Ellison, oh, that's Carl Banks's number. How could they get him? Not my fucking number. My number, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the next guy's number. My, I did my job in that number and I'm in the ring of honor. So, you know, I'm done. Yeah, I'm yeah, rooting yeah. for the next guy to be as good, if not better than me. So I, I, you know, nobody owns that number. If your name is Lawrence Taylor, you own 56. If you're if you're Michael Jordan, you own 23. Yeah, but yeah, you're sure. 58, you're, you know, you're Jack Lambert, you're whoever. <laughs> Antonio you know? Pierce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I'm like, okay, I just want to do good, you know, no, it, no matter what number I wear. 
was there any part of you watching Antonio Pierce be such a great giant? You know, was there any part of you that was like, all right, making 58 proud? You know, like, was there part of you? Uh, we used like, to talk about it all the time. We used to refer to each other as 58. Like, what's up, 58? He's like, what's up, 58? And, nice. you know, he's such, such a great guy, great player for the Giants, but just a, just a smart guy to talk football with, too. Like, if you had a conversation with Antonio, it could be a simple question, and we could end up an hour later still talking about the dynamics of football or a particular play. And how things work. So he was, he was a guy that made me proud that I wore fifty eight. Yeah, I just had to, I just had to know because you know how numbers are nowadays. Like people are selling them and buying them and marketing yeah. themselves. They they got jewelry with their numbers on them. Like to some guys, you know, everybody's all over Tony because they gave him eighty nine. You know, like yeah, it gets it gets crazy. But I had to at least find out if that was a. You know, and, yeah, and, and I can pretty much check. tell you, I can pretty much tell you that Mark Bavaro could care less either. <laughs> <laughs> and he and I are kind of in the same mindset. He's probably like, oh, what, what is everybody so nuts about it? Fuck it. He can have it. I'm done. You know, it's kind of like, um, it, it's always, but it's fine. You know, and believe me, I get the fandom. I get the fact that players are attached to their favorites. I'm sorry, fans are attached to their favorite players. So they have an affinity for a number. Like the the, the coolest thing that um, I see every year out of our um, press box where we're called, where Bob Papa and I are calling the game, I look down and there are two season ticket holders. One wears a Banks jersey, the other one wears a Bavaro jersey. And it's the coolest thing ever because Mark and I are really good friends and we were tight as teammates because, you know, we battled each other every day, right? Yep. So every year I send him that picture and say they still love us, you know? <laughs> but it's the coolest thing. Like they, that affinity for, you know, um, for Mark and I, um, it has a special meaning um, when you see Banks and Bavaro together because. You know, there are just so many, um, and you can listen to coaches talk about it more than he and I ever would, um, but just the battles we would have in practice to make each other better, right? And Mark, you know, for me, made me as good as I was, and I'm sure he'll say the same thing because it wasn't an offensive practice versus a defensive practice. Like when the offense is time to go, Mark wanted me to play him at game speed so that he could really get better and then when it's a defensive uh practice same thing and then it became the expectation almost as though all the coaches would stand around and watch us go one-on-one with each other but it was just like the two of us made each other better and then you know Howard Cross was another guy that that really kind of worked, you know, we worked together and it was like, Carl, I need you to give me everything you got. I, you know, I need to work on certain things. And then, you know, Mike Pope, the tight ends coach would, would come over and say, okay, Banksy, we got a little nine on seven today. I need you to give Mark everything you got. And, you know, it was just an expectation and it was fucking hard though. Like it's like <laughs> working against Bavaro and working against um, Howard Cross was, was hard. And then, you know, Zeke Moai, for the time, he was there, same thing. They were so well coached, but we just made each other so much better. And um, it was just, but it was fucking hard. Like, nobody else had to do a drill um, like Mark and I. It was just, and that's why, like, every time I see that Banks and Bavaro jersey in the stand, I sent it to him, and it's, you know, because it has a special meaning to us. Yeah, oh, that, that's that's cool. I was... uh so like I said, my my daughter's seventeen, right? So she's mm-hmm. she's going she's going to the uh, MSU in two years. So I was gonna, and I have a son that's um, he's third, he turned thirteen last week. So I was gonna get them for 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 Christmas. I didn't do it. I probably should have done it, but I was gonna get a Plaxico, and I was gonna get a Banks throwback for for nice. them, you know. So when they when they go, when she walks on campus, you know. She's a scholar and uh, athlete. She'll have to be there probably in July. Um, so, like, when she goes, I wanted her to walk on campus and be like, yo, I know what time it is here. <laughs> there you go. They would have been like, who is this 54? They'd have to go, they have to go into the Duffy Doherty building. I think they still got my number, my name, my face on the wall there. 
yeah. for anybody that recognizes what she's wearing, they'll be like, oh, this girl gets it. You know, yeah, exactly. she's in the metal. Yeah. Exactly. You know, because like she like she's into it and she's and I told her that you went there and I told her Plaxico went there. Like uh -huh. she was like, oh man, I want one of those. I was like, I don't know if they That's make them cool. that small, honey. I mean, I'll, I'll let me see what I can do. So I found them. Like you can get them made. You know, you got to yeah. make it happen. You got to do it, Craig. Yeah, and then my son, I'm gonna give him the old. I think Plaxico wore number four, if I remember. Yeah. Correctly. So. Yeah. My, uh, Michael Stewart, show him the jacket. Show him what you got. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's say that I got this a year after you guys won that second Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah I know the jacket well. It looks and so fresh. I will fresh. tell you this, Carl. I, I will tell you this. These guys can tell you. I've never worn this. And I was hoping one day to wear this when you come on. So there we go. I'm glad. I'm <laughs> glad we got both of those things out of the way. Listen, I've been I've been trying to get so you probably forget, Carl. You talked to a million people, but two three years ago three years ago you made those those uh they were like a silver or maybe a gray and all the players yeah. wore them to london yeah the london jacket i i buy a half dozen of them i mean i would look those jackets are so nice i remember oh they jeff they wore like this like it was like a silver gray satin. yeah it was a commemorative mm. piece we did with the london flag on it and everything yeah i'll take i'll take three of them I was gonna say they're so bad. They were so they were so awesome. And like, yeah, we sold jacket. out of those. And um, so we do them for every team that go. I think the Jets are going this year, so it'll be a really cool um, creation. We're looking. You know, I have talked. I talked to my designer today about creating something special there. So Jet fans will have something fun to, yeah, to well, buy and wear. Well, I can't wear a jet jacket. That won't go over. Well. I understand, but I got some other stuff for for Giants <laughs> fans. We got a real, we got a real cool program uh, coming out this fall. I mean, it's it's this one. This one will be epic. It's it's a dope um, group. We got a whole capsule collection coming out, and right. uh, well, we're it's always called, it's it's called a locker room player exclusive. So everything Ooh. is authentically locker room quality back to where when I played every element is like it's 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 pretty special group it's a pretty pretty special group so we're not messing around with you know cheap quality or newfangled tech quality we're doing throwback fleece we're doing it's 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 a you'll 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 know it's it's like if you were a kid, right, or you went to high school with somebody that went to college or played in the pros, and every time you came home from the summer, that guy's like, yo, when you gonna give me one of those sweatsuits? I need one of those sweatsuits, right? I need one of those jackets. It's that type of quality. It's, no, I, it's like... George Martin used to live like four miles from me growing up. I used to uh -huh. live in Wanakew, and he lived in, at least when he was younger, lived in Ringwood. Right. Yep. And I I would see him, I would see him with some, I mean, he had such cool gear. I mean, I'd see him like maybe like three times a year. Yeah. Maybe you'd be like at a supermarket or you'd see him at the, the Willowbrook Mall. And like, yeah. you'd be like, who's that giant? Like, that's George Martin. And you'd be like, yeah. man, he looks good in that gear, man. Always yeah. with the big wide stripes and stuff. Oh, yeah, it was cool. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so it's, it's, it's this collection, uh, it's a five piece collection that's you know like we call it locker room player exclusive but it's um there's a lot of fun stuff that we're going to be doing with it actually um and i'm actually telling you guys i haven't told anybody Woo, exclusive. We have, um, exclusive yes yeah. yeah we have a whole commercial being shot with some of the players uh, um and that commercial is a remake of the old starter commercial called What Does It Take to Be the Best? And um, it features, that one featured Emmett Smith and Carl Malone and Don Shula. But um, mm -hmm. we're remaking that and it's, um, what we're doing is gonna be special, but it's, yeah. it's, 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 this like, this is one of the more, um, this capsule is one I'm, I'm super excited about. Like this is, it's, give, it's gonna give you that that but, feeling of authenticity. Not only are we getting an exclusive, I'm I'm feeling like we're we're working on getting a 
getting a you know on the list like the Santa. It kind of feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like that. Like <laughs> well, you know that. Yeah. Hey, listen, you know I that? told you. I, got I told you. you earlier. I gave away those five. Might, you know what? I might debut the spot on your site. Boom! <laughs> let's go. Well, oh, I'm a, I'm gonna make an announcement right now too, just so you know, Carl. So I've had to make a long story short. I used to work for Bleacher Report years ago, and uh -huh. when Turner bought Bleacher Report, they let us all go, right? So uh -huh. I made N I made NY Giants rush, you know, because I was pissed off. So nine years later, I've had the same website for, for nine years. Because we're interviewing today, okay, it's been a secret. These guys haven't seen it. Even the rest of our team hasn't seen it. Tomorrow, when we upload the, the interview that we're doing right now, we're launching a new NYGiantsRush.com. Nice. So what we're going to do is we'll put whatever you got, bang right on the front and let me tell Ooh, you we may we actually may premiere that 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 um that spot with you guys it, right. it, you know it, it, it's um it's fun though but but rest assured we make sure you guys have the product All right. well, nice. listen, we, like i told you yeah, you, nice you, of you i remember uh i remember you gave me you gave me the, the like the summer line or the spring line last year to gave away we gave away yeah. the 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 jacket so you you're always good to us i have people all the time like you and carl tight how i'm like look we're, we're twitter friends or as jeff says we're twitter chums but i've twitter actually chums. never met the man yeah. they're like wait you've had season tickets for 30 years i'm like yeah but i don't go hunt the man down i'm like <laughs> I, I go to the game i go home i listen to, i will say i will say that like there's nothing more enjoyable than listening to you and bob um yeah. Uh, uh, kill, but but killing Lance, he must be a really good guy. But you guys, you guys give him Listen, such a hard time. <laughs> Lance Meadow is the absolute best. <laughs> he is he is the uh, Lance is one of our guys, but he is the absolute best uh, broadcast partner or teammate, broadcast teammate. Yes. He's he's incredible. But the funny thing is, we always tease him, and this is something like. If I had to program like a post game show, the one thing I would get rid of is the reading of stats. Like we used to tease Lance, like when are you gonna get to an actual highlight? Cause he'll go down and read like the entire stat sheet before he gets to a highlight. But that's just the way the, the post game shows are, are um, programmed. But I think it's to buy time so that they could get to the player interviews. And like we used to tell our boss, Don Sperling, listen, just let him get into the highlights so we can talk and give the fans something to listen to because they're riding home and sitting in traffic and all Lance is doing is giving the play-by-play, -play, you know, <laughs> down this whole, I yeah. mean, the shit is like the first quarter, it could be like 40 plays and he's just reading every one. I'm like, can we get into like actually a highlight? So, but he's the best. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy that. Jeff, were you going to talk about Super Bowls? You had something on that list. I had something, uh, for you and I, I spoke with my dad for about a half hour to prep for this interview because my dad, he's the reason I'm a diehard Giants fan. I was born in 83, so the games were always on every Sunday. You were the reason my dad was yelling at the TV every Sunday, but I talked to him and, you know, he's like, you can't talk about Carl Banks without talking about Lawrence Taylor. And you guys were, were joined and you, like in my eyes, you started that Giants tradition of defense and what my dad was saying, because he watched every snap in a way that I couldn't be in that young, mm -hmm. but you know, teams would have to game plan for LT. And he's like, what made the giants great is that they couldn't just run away from LT because Carl Banks is on the other side. And my dad was like, I don't ever remember him missing a tackle, missing an assignment. He was always there. And so leading to this, and by the way, my dad says, hi, already says hi. Hi, Artie. <laughs> you know were you aware that teams were game planning away from lt and maybe coming to you did that sure. pump up? Um, you, were you always ready so, for yeah so it's two things like you have a certain skill set i'm not trying to sound like liam liam neeson but <laughs> very specific um, set of i skills. walked through the door with a skill set right and that skill set was being a sure tackler and the ability to not get blocked, right? I walked through the door with that. I didn't know how well that skill set would hold up um, when put under fire, like to the to the maximum degree, because it wasn't like if a team wanted to run the ball, they would try a little bit at Lawrence and they try a little bit at me. It just became, we're running to this guy, right? 
And so I had to take their best players. Uh, they send their best players to try to block me. And um, I just knew that that was going to be the thing that I could do uh, amongst other things that I could do. But if there was going to be one thing that stood out about me within a defense with such talented players, it would be the fact that I was going to be unblockable if you ran at me. Like I could pass rush, I could blitz. And we did a lot of that, but we knew, you know, who our best guy was at that. So, you know, I could end up with a double digit sack year and it would still be about Lawrence Taylor. And I, everybody was fine with that. But like, how do you make your mark in a defense that's so talented, right? Yeah, sure. Well, it, it's easy doing what you're asked to do, doing what you're counted on to do, right? It was not about the flash pieces to me. It was like, okay, this is what I'm asked to do. This is what they count on me to do. So I'm going to do it better than anyone else. And, you know, that's when people start, well, you know, you can't run at Banks and he's this and he's the best run defender as a linebacker in this league. We've seen a long time, but it was about, just being consistent because that's what our defense count, you know, they counted on me to do that. And um, the thing that made our, our, our group so great was the fact that we were all accountable to each other. And, and, and the thing was, you know, with Belichick and, and with coach Parcells, you know, it was just, you know, and you hear Belichick says all the time, now, just do your job. And that was our mantra. We just wanted to do it better. We wanted to make the guy in front of us quit, you know, while doing our job. And um, that was that was my thing, you know. Um, if, if there was going to be a skill set that I walked through the door with that I knew was going to be pretty good and it didn't matter who they lined up in front of me, that was going to be it. Like, I, I'm not going to – well, I missed one tackle or a guy that was better than me on Monday night, um, Randall Cunningham, which – you know, it's so interesting. Uh, that, that plays. Yeah, it's so yeah, interesting, though. Military, like, yeah. I still, you know, Philly fans think it's like something that really drives me crazy, right? They're like, hey, how about Randall? Remember Randall on Monday night? I'm like, yeah, he made a hell of a football play, right? So it's like, you know, <laughs> we look at it because I don't miss tackles, right? And so I'm like, well, shit, this is just the equivalent of playing great defense on Michael Jordan. I got my hand in his face. I mean, and he still hit it. That's yeah. basically what it came down to. I mean, yeah. he was better than I was on that play. And he and I saw each other maybe a year after that game, and we both laughed about it. I said, boy, that play really made you famous, huh? And he just starts <laughs> laughing. But it's like, you know, people think it was such a thing to me. It was more about him than it was about me. It wasn't my yeah. fault. He was just that good, you know? Yeah. And Not, yeah. Nine out of ten quarterbacks are going down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, ten oh, out yeah. of ten, he was just a freak, <laughs> right? You know, I did. You know, played the play as perfectly as can be, and he just was better. You know, and I'm good with that. You, you know what's amazing too is so I've played and watched a lot of football through the years, and what I've always appreciated, like I, I, I've been sitting in that stadium, you know, since the early '80s, and my dad had tickets since the '68. You know, a lot of a lot of Giants games in my house, but yeah. what I always appreciated about that nine year 10 year span was the gang tackling just the outright you know ferocity on the ball carrier like it was gang tackling guys went down low and form tackled like you don't see that in today's game guys wrapping up top they're you know you just don't see that that type of defense anymore because you know you had you know there was Carson and LT and then you had guys like Eric Howard and Dorsey and you just had you just had guys they didn't care how big they were how fast they were just guys hit you know it's a different game now i get it but it was a, it was something i always appreciated about that era it was just the the ability to make an open field tackle <laughs> yeah know? so that was the thing um gang tackling and then it, it still holds true if you look at the best defenses in football they still do it they still do it and the reason is is because Again, you talk about that sense of pride as a defender. When the film cuts on, right, and everybody talk about, yeah, we're going to hunt, we're going to hunt, right? And if you got seven guys to the, to the ball and the other four guys are not in the frame, 
then you're pretty much loafing on the play. And so you need to either be in the frame, which is probably about the size of the screen, uh, or if you're not in the frame, then your teammates are like finding you. They're like, dude, you got to be a part of this. But like for us, it was the more guys to the football, the less likelihood we're going to give up a hundred yard rusher or that a guy, if a guy breaks a tackle, you know, it won't be noticed because we got so many guys to the football. So, and then, you know, Bill even gave us even more incentive. Like, you know, if you got six or seven guys, if the other guys are in the frame, and this is like the beautiful stuff about Bill Belichick in terms of how everything is related in football. So he's like, okay, I got, I got um, seven guys to the football and Jim Bird just pulled the football out of the, the player's hand. You four efforts could have been running and you, you may not have been able to tackle, but if you were in this frame, there's a good likelihood you would have recovered that fumble. So like there, he always has a method to the madness. So, you know, if you're not close enough to the play, but there could be a tip ball, there could be a, a you know, our guys, if we got that many guys to the football, Bill say, like, if we got this many people to the football, pull it out. And, you know, if you guys are running, we're going to end up getting that ball. And so it was just all those th different things that um, he would talk about that made football so practical and easy and, and functional, you know, because everything had had a reason uh, for being within within our, our teams. Uh, people, if you don't realize it, you're listening to the Giants guys. We're interviewing Carl Banks. We got some exclusives. We got some MSU talk. We broke out an old starter jacket that Michael Stewart's wearing. Michael, you got a question for Carl? Well, yeah, I do. And one quick one, quick one was that 84 draft where Carl was in. That was like one of the best Giant drafts I can remember. I mean, look at the guys that in that first Super Bowl for them all contributed. Uh, you know, you had Roberts, right? You had Reasons, you had Carl. Yeah, a lot of a lot of good plays. Hostetler. Hostetler. That was yeah. a great draft, first yeah. of all. And another thing, uh, that 86 run of uh, Carl, not to toot your horn because you're on, but you were definitely, and I love Lawrence Taylor, you were, you were the best defensive player during that whole run. And I think you had like double digits and tackles in the Super Bowl that year. Yeah, I had Denver. like 15, 15 yeah, solo tackles mean, or something like that. I, yeah, so, absolutely. Um, dominant. Yeah, it was, it was, that was a, a great, a great draft for us. Um, you know, we had guy, Elvis Patterson came in with me, Lionel Manuel, oh, Bobby oh, Johnson. All of those guys were in that draft class. So that was, you know, when they, Bill decided he was turning the roster over and he needed his guys. Um, but like love, the Super Bowl, right? Love so, Bobby Johnson. I, in that Super Bowl, like if, if you ask any athlete, you know, what's their idea of a perfect game, right? Whatever the plays that they make, they want that perfect game to be in the biggest game of their career. And I think I had as close to a perfect game as I ever, yeah. any football could ever, any football player could ever have. And it just happens to be in the Super Bowl. But it was, you know, I was really prepared for the moment. Um, I did. Um, so much in preparation of that game. I was actually talking to Bill Polian about, you know, how I even watch film for things I wasn't looking for. So that I just had a feel for the rhythm of the game, not just, you know, uh, plays that we went over in meetings, but just letting the film run and seeing what, what jumps out, getting a feel for, um, the cadence of an offense or the rhythm of an offense so that, you know, as the game goes on, I just kind of felt like there was nothing that they could do that I couldn't stop. Any difference between those two Super Bowls? Like, I know they're different games and different teams. We were like a different team. We were different teams. You know, obviously, in the uh, 90 uh, Super Bowl, we had a lot of injuries. You know, I missed part of that season. We lost our quarterback. We lost our running back. Um, so we had a lot of guys in and out of the lineup, but um, we still felt great about how good we were. And um, the difference was the freaking Buffalo Bills were just incredible. And um, we just came up with the most ingenious uh, yeah. 
ingenious game plan that nobody anticipated. So OJ Anderson. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I mean, dude was diesel in that game. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the the brilliance of Bill Belichick and how he coached you guys and everything, how much of Joe Judge, you know, how much of that influence do you see in Joe Judge, the way he conducts business and thinks about football? I think it's it's you know if if I had to say, it, it, and I've, I've been around a lot of guys who try to be like yeah. Belichick more so than have learned from Belichick. I think Joe Judge is the guy without trying to be Bill Belichick. He is authentically who he is, but you see a lot of the qualities of a young Bill Belichick, but he has the support of his city and of his team. So the Bill Belichick in Cleveland is the Bill is uh, uh, the qualities that I see in Joe Judge like all about football, no nonsense, no time to bullshit with the media. You know, in Cleveland, they had just come off of, of uh, Marty Schottenheimer, who was, you know, um, very friendly with the press. And But Bill, Bill Belichick is about football. He's about his players. He's about football. That's Joe Judge. Joe Judge is about all of this time that you want me to bullshit with the media <laughs> I could be working with a guy who needs to get better and teaching a guy what we need them to do and all the little things that are going to make a difference in a tight game. Um, and that's, you know, and that's not trying to imitate Bill Belichick. It just says that he learned the important, the most important tenets of, of success and of winning and of building a team. So um, he subscribes to, you know, the same principles as every successful coach, but he kind of gets it early. And, you know, people, and you see the same reactions. Oh, he's going to fail. He's, he's too hard on his players. He says, his players love him. I was going to say, they, they sure look love, like they love doing him. this stuff, right? And this is no shade to the new coach in Philadelphia, but how do you let your players negotiate you out of having a mandatory minicamp? Like not, not that, that, that's not the type of, and, and again, this is no shade. They, they live and they play and they could end up being a foot, good football team, but like you actually do have to practice. Football is a, a sport you got to actually practice to be good at. <laughs> yeah. And you got to command the room too, right? Yeah. But I don't know his command of the room, but just the fact that, that like, to be able to be negotiated out of a mandatory mini camp where you know if they're getting away with that, then I don't know what training camp is going to be like because they're going to be like, yeah, damn, coach, you were working us too hard. I mean, you know, so, but that, that is what it is and it's no shade, but just to contrast the two types of coaches, you know, and what Joe Judge believes in, I'll, he'll tell you, he want, the more opportunities he gets to work with a guy, the better they both can be and the better the team can be. And that's, you know, that's Bill Belichick-ish. You know, and not, it's not one size fits all, but it fits for what he's trying to do here in New York. And, uh, and Judge awesome. and Graham seem like they're two peas in a pod. They seem like they get along real well. Um, I've heard Bobby Skinner call him shake and bake. I mean, you, <laughs> I mean I'm just, these two guys seem like they fit well together, like two puzzle pieces. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, they both understand it. And, you know, both guys and, and Patrick and I are, are, are relatively close. Um, I've known Patrick since he was in, in basically an intern with the Patriots and okay. just learning it. And we spent a lot of time together talking football and he's never, you know, he's, he's never satisfied with anything that goes good or bad. Like he's always looking to improve. How can a player improve? How can he be better as a coach? And, you know, just relating to his players too. Like there are conversations he and I would have just on, you know, how do you think is the best way to relate to a player like this? You know, because think about coming in as a staff and all you heard is like, oh, well, Leonard Williams can't be coached or, you know, Leonard Williams is going to go because he just doesn't have this or that. 
And somehow that staff connected with Leonard Williams and he had his best year, yes, right? So yeah. I think those are the types of things that make coaches better when they can have great relationships with their players and their players produce. And so, and it's not like, you know, Patrick said, you know, Carl is this fucking guy, an asshole, what am I gonna have to do with him? He's like, he says, you know what, Carl, one of my big challenges is to make sure that we can connect with Leonard Williams because he's so talented that we just want to make sure that he could be a Richard Seymour type of guy and he's more athletic. You know, he talks in those types of terms, like, okay. I just want to make sure I can connect and we have a great relationship because I think he could be one of the best players in football. It sounds like he's got good vision. And I yeah. think not, not everybody has that. I, I was going to ask you about Patrick is he's got a very wide open defense. I see him rushing two, rushing three, rushing four. Like he's interchanging guys. I mean, he's got Carter Coughlin playing the inside when he went through college playing the outside. Is that a tough defense to, to, to staff? Like the person, the personnel that you come, that you bring in gotta be flexible, right? Cause it's a very yeah. fluid defense. So the thing that um, you hear Joe Judge talk about all the time is players with uh, diverse skill sets, guys that can be multiple things, because he wants to he wants to cross train them, and there's a reason why he wants to cross train them. Not that they're are going to be a problem for a team to game plan. That's kind of the um, the added benefit or the side effects of cross training. Sure. But because injuries can decimate a roster, is you when, once you have the ability to cross train a guy and you can put him in a safety to play corner or a corner to play safety or a linebacker that can play up or down in space or blitz, then you your your roster due to injury is not a big hole. Yeah, you're not sure. <laughs> Right. So the more talent you have and the more you can cross train those guys, the added benefit of that is, hey, um, Washington, figure out who's coming where. And that, there's been a lot of even when Patrick was in um, Miami, Miami, it would be like, who's the hell who's coming from where? Right. And then if you say, OK, well, he's coming from here. Here's our mismatch. And you find out that it's not a mismatch because just because you didn't see this guy do it doesn't think, don't think that he didn't practice it. He's been, they've been waiting to run this and this guy can actually cover or this guy can actually blitz. So um, they're, they're really good at that. And the fact that they have stacked themselves at corner and safety and even to a large degree at linebacker or let's just say pass rushers. Um, it's going to be a, a lot of fun to watch this defense because they're going to be so interchangeable. All right. I didn't ask this question then about the linebacker. I'm sure Michael and Jeff will both tell you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Blake Martinez. Mm -hmm. um, I, you and I have actually even talked about it on Twitter when people get crazy. Why doesn't the man get any respect? To me, he's the best inside linebacker they've had since Antonio Pierce. Like You and I have both been on the same thread about all these nut jobs talking about how he can't cover cover. Not only did you prove them wrong with a couple of pieces of tape you dropped in there, but, and I remember it clearly, like the guy's a tackling machine. He's a cerebral player. He's a Stanford guy. He gets it. I mean, like, I, why doesn't this guy get any well, it's love? Part, part of the reason is because you have a guy that's a Packer fan that just used to post videos and and the video just basically didn't have context. He was just pushing a narrative and sure. hoping that, you know, people. And so I went and looked at his videos. And I'm like, you fucking idiot. Now, and forgive my French, but he's talking about how Blake couldn't keep up with a guy across, running across the, the car. Well, it wasn't like, even his was, assignment. Right. I'm like, it's a zone defense. He passed it off, stupid. <laughs> you know, just stuff. But like, you know, and I always tell young fans, watch your diet. You know, because if you ingest the wrong narratives, it just it yeah. just ruins your your view of how you should see this game. Because you're ingesting stuff from somebody who doesn't even know the game. Oh, they just man. talk like they know a lot, and they have no idea. Yep. You know, and so, but but Blake is, in my opinion, one of the top five middle linebackers in this league today. 
Uh, he's smart. He's a tackler, great instincts, and he does what they ask him to do. So if somebody says, well, he can't do this, my, you know, my retort would be name two that can. Yep. No, he doesn't. He's not good in coverage. Are they asking him to do it? Exactly. Whatever they're asking him to do, he does it better yeah. which, than which drives me crazy. of the league. Which drives me crazy because, the, I mean, if you look the last five years, we've been down the bottom of the NFL in run defense. You finally right. got a guy yeah. that, that accelerates the entire defense because yeah. – he can close the rundown, and they still want to complain. I just don't get why he doesn't get any love. Um, well, Jeff as long as he's loved here in New York, that's, that's right. all that matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's all that matters. You know, no. it won't be the first time a Giants player didn't get love. Yeah, yeah. I sent him. A, I sent him a note when he got signed. I and I didn't expect anything back. I said, "Welcome to the land of the linebackers. Good luck." And he and he tweeted it back. He said, "Thank you. Looking forward to it. I thought it was pretty cool." Yeah. You know, because that, that's what I grew up with, 80s, 90s. It's always yeah. been the land of the linebacker. Yeah. You know, like that's just – Giants are known for running the ball and and and, and great linebackers. That's yeah. just been – you can go back to Sam Huff. Right, yeah. right, right, Michael Stewart? We can go yeah. back there. These guys – Great have, defense back then. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I just – I'm always – we don't even talk about – Jeff, well, Jeff, the analytical company, the yeah. analytics – I won't even say their name on my show or on my website because they're so full of crap on these lists that they pump out. You know, I'm sure, you know, it's got value to somebody. Chris Collinsworth evidently owns it, but like, man, yeah. the stuff they put out is infuriating. Um, you know, they're an asset to a large degree um, and for a new generation of players who think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, but, you know, analytics are, they're a tool. They're not a solution. And I think we see it in baseball a lot where managers now try to manage strictly on analytics and it, it ruins games. It, it costs you games because, you know, the numbers don't have a heartbeat. The players do, right? Mm -hmm. If you look out and you say, okay, our power 38 is our bread and butter and it's uh, second and six and we can run this and we're guaranteed four yards and it's a third and two, right? And you run it and you get it. But if your left tackle just got hurt and his backup ain't worth a shit, the numbers don't say that, right? So you line up, that's Kansas City, that's Kansas City. They kept trying the same things and getting the same result, right? So, oh, your left tackle's out, but the numbers say this is our bread and butter play. Well, wait a minute. It's third and, you know, it's second and six. Let's run this. We'll be in third and two. Oh, loss of four. <laughs> oh, offside. Only lost oh, a lot of fours. Wait. Oh, offsides. You know, illegal procedure. You know, so the, the numbers are great when the, the there's a static uh, variable. When the variables start to change, those numbers don't hold up. And so that's where, you know, coaching is still important. Yeah. Uh, having yeah. a feel for the game is still important. Like, you can't run the same plays with different people. You know, you got to have all the variables have to be the same in order for whatever the numbers say that is. Yep. Those variables have to be the have to be the same. So, um, but you know, they they do a good job of of being a big assist to coaching and, and scouting, but it's not the end all and be all. And I'm not anti analytics because you know what Chris has done with it is just taking it to a whole nother level. Like analytics has been around since he and I played, you know, and he's older than I am. And, you know, I'll give you a classic case. And I was talking to Bill Polian about this, um, of a classic case of analytics was our defensive game plan versus the Buffalo Bills and how we arrived at it. And it was, you know, when Bill was explaining we were going to go with this two-man front and we had to allow Thurman Thomas to run the football, he said, listen, normally in this league, we go back four games to find the tendency." I went back eight games and it's a trend. So there's a difference between a tendency and a trend. Their only pass, their, their biggest run play was a swing pass to Thurman Thomas. 
And he said they, they had gotten rid of their entire run game. It was a draw or, or a swing pass to Thurman, and that's how they ran the football. But he looked at the numbers. He said, look, they don't run the football other than these two plays, and it's a trend. It's been trending since, since um, the middle of the season. They're not going to change it for this game. If it were four games, you could have you would probably have to prepare for something different. But if you're doing it for eight for eight games, it's a you're trend. Gonna, yeah, you're gonna keep so, doing it. Yeah. So I mean, so I you know, I'm not anti. I mean, some of the stats are, are meaningless unless, you know, obviously it feeds into the, the fantasy football um, community a lot, which you know, it benefits them. It also like, you know, Chris's timing is probably as good as you could get in terms of data analytics as it relates to, to sports or especially football, because you have the, the increased exposure uh, to the gambling community mm. and the ability to, <laughs> and it's so interesting, like prop bets, right? On football games now. Hey, we all like, what was it like three years ago? You didn't even, you couldn't even make a prop bet. Now you can make a prop bet during the course of a game. That's yeah. a pretty good segue, Carl, because we actually have a sponsor called Pickup, uh -huh. and they actually create props for 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 anything you want. Yeah, I actually put them on. Like I can literally right now. I'll play this tomorrow. They'll make a prop bet for anything I want. They and they make them for every team in the NFL. Yeah. And then you can literally, like for, for, for pickup, you're basically playing a prop. You have no money involved, but if you win enough of your prop bets, you stack up money like a credit card, and then yeah. you can turn around and use it to buy, let's say, uh, like a new era cap, or you can yeah. buy a jersey. Right. So, yeah, we, 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 uh, we see the prop bets. You know, they're, they've gotten so popular. Yeah, um, like two years ago, it, was, it didn't exist, but now you can bet on – you know, whether or not they're going to throw a ball to uh, Alvin Kamara when um, the, the uh, what's the quarterback for New, New, New Orleans, the uh, Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, yep. Taysom Hill comes in the game. His primary target's going to be on this play, Alvin Kamara. You know, just they have so much of that stuff, but like. It doesn't make a Chris's lot of sense, though. Does, they give you all of this information that you can like look at and bet on. Well, it's you know, now gotten I, to the point when they do the uh, when they announce the lineups, the starting lineups, they have their rank yeah. for PFF. They have yeah. their their rank as soon as they announce their name. That's part of the network. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, show. I'm sure. Jeff, I'm sure you saw it today. Best cornerbacks in the league. They show they show they roll out six of the best cornerbacks in the league. Bradbury's not in there. How is it even possible that they have an algorithm that comes up? with leaving Bradbury out of the best six corners in the league. It's like not possible. Well, yeah. it's because it's not real football. It's just based on numbers. It's just a piece they'll, of they'll, it. They'll, they'll crush the numbers to say, well, Bradbury, so-and-so ranks better than, better than Bradbury on passing plays of five yards or less, 10 yards or less, 10 yards or more. But it's like, is he better? Or is it yeah, just the, yeah. what the numbers say? Well, maybe... Bradbury doesn't get a lot of five yard or less passes. Like, you know, what's what's the what's the criteria? Is it 20 passes? How does he perform with 20 passes or just they two? They don't tell you how to they don't tell you how to make the soup. Right, exactly. Not only that, if, if they're if they're not throwing at Bradbury because he's so good, then where yeah. is that in the stats? Because they, yeah. they don't want to throw to his side of the field. So it might be only one pass attempt of 10 or less yards. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I got one less because I know you don't want to hang out with us all night long. Here's yeah, my I last go question. Watch basketball. <laughs> exactly. You you've played with Sims, you've played with Hosteller, you've been covering Eli for pretty much his entire career. Give me, give me a give me a riff on Jones. Like, do you like what you see? Is does he have the ability to, to like step in and take this team at least to the playoffs? Like, what what's your real take on Jones? Because we, uh, Jeff, Michael, you're both agreeing with you. We like Jones, right? Do we not? Are yeah. we not Jones guys? Yeah, so, like, Daniel has a really good skill set. Uh, I think he's proven that over all the guys that were drafted in his class, um, quarterbacks, and then even those that were compared the year before, um, he's held up pretty good statistically uh, and performance-wise. Um 
I think, you know, he's got he's got to protect the football. That's that's a given. But just from a skill set, a guy who can run uh, as big as he is, um, he's got he throws a, a beautiful football, a very catchable ball, great ball placement. Um, and now he's got he's got tools around him and he's a second year within an offense. So I just think he's going to to blossom into a great quarterback. I do. And I use the word great. He's, he's going to be a great quarterback in this league. Um, just just based on his skill set. And it's he's a big guy. I mean, he's six five. He can run. Right. And he's got a big arm. And so um, there's not a lot that that an offensive coordinator can't do with him. But then. When you give him a diverse set of wide receivers from Galladay to Cadavius Tony to a, you know, just a blazer. Um, Shepard. You know, no, no, Shep is there, um, but Slayton, a blazer. So he's got so much going on. And then a back or uh, two backs that can catch the football and, and one who's an exceptional runner, that, that, that skill, that toolbox you know, will make a quarterback exceptional. Um, and he, he just has to do his job. Are you worried about the line or, <laughs> or are they going to be good enough to let I think Daniel the, Jones uh, Given the fact that they did not make changes or make additions to the offensive line, tells you they feel pretty good with the way they're headed. You know, um, because sometimes you add a guy and he's just a stopgap guy and you look, and I'm sure they sit in that um, that meeting room and they say, okay, uh, how much better is he than Hernandez? Well, what's the upside for Hernandez? And the guy may say, or a scout or an assistant coach may say, well, Hernandez will probably be even with him by the fourth week of the season and better than him afterward. So they're like, let's save our money. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just keep coaching the guys that we have. So, um, and I think we saw that this offensive line um, got better each and every week. So I, I, I just think that they'll be okay. And the fact that they can run the ball even makes them a better offensive line because they don't have to worry about being predictable. Yeah, right and I think, they, I think they bought uh, Saquon some time too. They filled up the running back room with some diverse and guys. Kyle Rudolph too. Uh, He's going to do a good job for him. I, I'm, yeah, I'm excited will. about Rudolph. I know like, you know, the yep. poor guys had a revolving uh, world of quarterbacks over there. So yeah, I'm a, you know, yep. Christian... Christian Ponder, Teddy yeah. Bridgewater, Cousins. Yeah. So, all right. Well, look, Carl, thank you. Can't thank you enough for hanging out with us. Thanks exactly. for having me, man. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, we're going to put this up tomorrow on the brand new website. We got an exclusive. We're going to give some stuff away. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm, listen, we're back in the stadium, by the way. So now yeah. I can actually give you a shout out because we're. There we go. You know, I sit on the 22 yard line, 22 rows up. So right. You're, right, you're right over my shoulder. 22-22. Exactly. All right, Carl. Thank, thanks again for everything, my Thank friend. You, I appreciate the Thank time. You, and, uh, I appreciate you know, it. Maybe, you, maybe you'll consider coming on again after the season. We'll see. <laughs> All right, thanks, Carl. Carl. Thanks right, for thank everything. Right. Peace.